When they asked me to, they asked me to come up with a workshop or a presentation idea. I, I told them I didn't want to just do a, a lecture to you guys, that I wanted to do something more interactive where we could share information. So that's what this is all about. So what we did is I, I solicited questions from different art directors and editors and publishers, and that's what you're going to see. You're going to see the questions that people ask, and I'll try to answer them, and then you know we'll have plenty of time for other questions, and then if. Other people want to share their concerns on the topics we talk about, just jump right in. Because some of the questions people ask me, honestly, I had no idea how to answer because they're really hard. Especially the, the poor woman who said, do you have any suggestions on time management? And, oh my gosh. So we could use some help from that anyway. So here we go. So uh, the first question was from Kim Larson. And, and Kim is the art director of Alberta Venture and Alberta Oil and 18 Bridges. And, um, she asked a nice, easy question. <laughs> How can I lead a team into the future when I'm stuck in the past? Where to start? Uh, um, now, I think this is a question, when I talk to art directors especially, they're all really frantic right now because of you know, the 9,000 new technologies that we're being confronted with. And the first thing I always remind them is that it, art directors specifically have gone through so many technological changes over the past 15 or 20 years. I mean, we've gone from, you know, hot type to ATEX to desktop publishing from, I assume most of you probably started out in Quark to InDesign, you know, to the CS series. And, and, you know, we've gone from, you know, having to send out all our photographs to be retouched to doing it all ourselves in Photoshop. I mean, the, the, the technological changes that we've mastered ourselves are really phenomenal. So. You know, when I get a question like that, Kim, I always say, well, you know, first remember that you've already mastered every technological change over the last, you know, 5, 10, 15 years that's come your way. So being confronted with this new stuff is nothing, and you can certainly handle it. Um, but I think that the thing you have to do um, specifically to get ready for the future is to really embrace, you know, whatever the, the, the next uh, challenge is. And every art director here, I would really urge you, if you haven't already, to get your hands into the DPS uh, Adobe uh, iPad creation system. Because if you're working in InDesign, which I assume most of you are, you know, taking that next step, if you haven't done it, to, to do a, an iPad app is really nothing. Uh, and, and let me just tell you that I'm working with somebody right now with two people and we're making an app at my apartment. You know, it's that easy. And we're doing it in my little studio apartment that's smaller than the room I have here in the hotel, you know, with my one desktop computer. And we're making a, uh, we're doing an iPad app for ARP. It's not that hard. And Adobe has a system now where anybody can make their own app and upload it to the Adobe uh, content viewer. You don't have to be working at a magazine to do that. So there's no excuse not to do that. And, and, I, and it's really easy. And you can, you can go online to places like lynda.com and, and get a video uh, seminar that will show you how to do this if you don't know how to do it. And also the folks at Adobe are very helpful. So the, the first thing I would say is, You've really just got to grasp it. And you, if, if it's a question about iPad, you've just got to do it. You've got to convince your, your magazine or your publisher to just try an iPad app. And, and I'm going to talk about that a little more at lunchtime today. But um, the second thing is that uh, in, in terms of the future, the other thing I think that it, people are really concerned about is social media. And, and again, I would urge you, especially the art directors, the social media is so tailored to the visual person these days that there's no excuse not to have your own personal visual expression in social media, whether it's Facebook or, or Instagram or, or um, Tumblr or whatever. Um, so those are the f two first things. And I think, um, y you know, other than that, you've just really got to pay attention to the developing technology and, and look at what your peers are doing and, and what, you know, the, the sort of industry leaders are doing. I don't know if that answers the question. Is there more? I mean, do you want to do any follow-up on that? or? Yeah, I mean, I think in your case, if you're not doing apps, you should just convince one of your publishers. My own feeling would be 18 Bridges, which I think is a smaller, more yeah. boutique magazine. Get them to do a one-shot app, like a best of 18 Bridges. You know, I'm just making this up without having seen it more than once. But you could do a, a, a one-shot app, a digital version of 18 Bridges, the best of. We, we actually did that. When I was a Reader's Digest, we did a best of for... Um, 
There's a Canadian magazine called Best Health that some of you might be familiar with, the Reader's Digest publishes. And we did a best of app that we put out. And we did it in about three weeks. And it was great. And it gave our staff a real, you know, it, it was a real learning tool. And I don't know how it did, but, but what it did is it trained us all and it trained their editorial staff on how to do an app. And it was great. And it cost zero. That was the best part. I mean, it cost a lot of sweat and labor, you know, but it didn't cost any money. So. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Of course. For a magazine, how close should the magazine, the website, and the app be? Like the similarities and differences? Well, I'm going to address that at lunchtime today, but I think. Uh, you know, a friend of mine has a really great quote about that, and, and he said, platforms are not agnostic. And, and what they meant by that was that every platform has to be designed for functionality and to serve the audience that's using it. And the same people that read your magazine are not the same people who read it on the app, who read it on the website. So, you know, you really, want, when you work on those, you want to have them designed to appeal to the specific audience that, that uses it. I don't know if that makes sense. On the other hand, you kind of want to brand it so it all feels like it's the same publication. So this was from uh, Terry Bullock and Julie Wands, who are at Apple Magazine. And it's a double question. Yeah, I think you get the point. How can editors better articulate their visions to art directors? And how can an art director better articulate their visual objectives for a project? I think basically what they're asking is, how can art directors and editors work better together? I'm assuming that's probably a problem or a concern for most of you, whether you're an editor or an art director. And um, you know, really, when I talk to art directors and editors, it's, I, there's really no way around this. That the, you have to have a great working relationship between the two. And if you don't, it's not going to work. You know? and, and when people ask me, like, what's the key to doing a great, having a great looking magazine, it's having a, an editor that you ha are in sync with and, and vice versa. You know? and, you, you know, these days it's really difficult to have a great magazine overall that doesn't have an in sync uh, visual, uh, you know, visual look. And, and so how do you make that happen? And um, I think for editors, it's hard because editors are not used to, to thinking visually. They, you know, they think in terms of words. So you have to remember that as an editor, that you're, deal you're talking to an art director who basically thinks visually. And, and, and in my experience, a good thing for an editor to do is to show an, an art director visual examples. I always ask my editors this, like, show me an example of what you're thinking about. What is this? You know, what's this animal like? Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm getting over a cold, you guys, so. So I think for an editor, it's, it's good to show your art director examples from other magazines or, or things you've done in the past. You know, this is a good way to communicate with them. And um, for an art director, I think, you, it's really worth your while to you know, think like an editor. I, I can't stress that enough. And when you, when you talk to your editor and you're trying to get you know, your visual ideas, it's not just enough to say, you know, I want to do this because it looks good. I mean, you have to get into an editor's head and think like an editor. Um, now, to take a step back, um, I think the most important thing and the, and the thing that facilitates this relationship the best is if you have a common agreed upon sort of visual direction for the magazine. I think that's always the most important thing. And, and I think this is where the art directors really have to take the lead. And what you want to do is sit with your editor or editors and come up with a, with a visual you know, vision and, and a framework to work within so that when everything you do and everything you develop fits into this framework. Um, it's much easier that way to say, you know, we don't do this, that we, you know, we can't do this because it's not part of our visual lexicon. Um, and I think having that commonality is really the important thing. I would also urge um, art directors a lot to, if you don't already, to develop lookbooks, you know, which are basically scrapbooks. I use them all the time um, with visual examples in. And, and I find editors respond really well to lookbooks. You, you know, they use them in fashion a lot for styling and stuff like that. And, and if I'm working on a project with an editor, the first thing I'll do is I'll make a lookbook. I'll, I'll cut out things from different magazines or from ads or you know, stills from movies or whatever I'm thinking about and put them all together in a scrapbook and then sit with them and say, look, here's what I'm thinking about. This is the visual world that, I, that, that I'm approaching. Does that make sense? Anyone want to ask any other questions on this topic? OK, thanks. Uh, when is it time to review and change your magazine architecture? This is from uh, Terry Bullock and Julie Wands again. A and what are five simple steps to new architecture? What they're really asking here, and I, there was someone else who asked the same question. 
uh, is about redesigns and, and how should we approach a redesign and when is the time to do it. Um, and my own feeling is if you have to ask whether you need a redesign, you probably do. That, you know, there are really two approaches to this. And, and one is, and Rolling Stone is a good example of someone who does this, your magazine is constantly changing and you do it in an organic way and you never really do a, a, a redesign, but you just constantly change it. If you think about Rolling Stone, they've never had a formal redesign in their entire history, but it's constantly changing. They, they never hesitate to change sections, typefaces, architecture, but they do it organically. And that's, that's a, one way to do it. And I, you know, that's one I, I myself like. And the other way is to, you know, do very, structured, okay, welcome to our new redesign, everything is different. And, and both, both are very valid approaches. Um, I think people don't redesign enough. I think these days, um, you know, graphic design and design starts to look old pretty quickly these days. And, and you know, you really don't want to be doing a magazine these days that looks like it's, you know, it's so 2000. Eight, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that's not good. Things change so fast. And, and again, if you if you think if you go, if you extend it to the social media world, places like Google and and Facebook are constantly changing. There, you know, Facebook just announced a redesign last week. You know, all the social media networks change. You know, a couple times a year. And and I'm not saying you should redesign a couple times a year, but I think your magazine should be so flexible that you can be making changes and adapting to changing. Uh, you know, reader engagement all the time. Um, given that, I think, um, you know, if they, if, they, if they wanted tips, I think the most important thing to look at with your redesign is the grid. I always start with the grid and come up with a real structured column width, um, letting, you know, that kind of thing. I think the grid is most important and, and I think people don't pay enough attention to it. Um, I, I think that, you know, obviously typography is important and, and um, the less you want to redesign, the more you should think about typography that's going to be more time, time, timeless, obviously. Um, and, um, you know, I think color is important. I mean, I look at a lot of magazines and it never ceases to amaze me how few have color palettes that are, you know, consistent and they stick with them. Um, but I, I, I always think that in, in terms of doing a redesign, it, you know, there's decoration redesign where you just change the the way it looks, you make it prettier, and I think that's good. And then there's there's the kind that really is is or is you know integral, and you and you're really changing things around. And and again, you have to think just about what what approach you're going to take with that. Uh, this is a hard one. So if anyone has any specific questions, I'd be glad to answer it. If you're thinking about doing one or, or... okay. Oh, this is a good one. This was actually a question that was sent to me by Kim and Joyce, but it didn't sound like a question an art director would ask, so I separated. How will excellence and adaptability in print design ensure that niche publications continue to thrive over the next decade? Um, well, this is good news, I think, for the art directors in the audience, because basically, I really think that, that the visual look of, of magazines over the next few years is key to their survival. Um, I think the days are over when bad-looking magazines can really survive and thrive. Um, you know, and, and the more challenging publishing gets and the more essential it is that they be branded across platforms, the more necessary it is that they look really smart and sharp and, and of the minute. And, you know, when I was saying uh, a minute ago about you don't want your magazine to look 2008, it's really true these days. People really demand, you know, an up-to-the-date look. And people are so much more sophisticated visually than they were 10, 15 years ago. I mean, Everybody is a designer now. Everybody can do graphic design at home on their computers, whether they're doing, you know, business cards or, or you know, websites or scrapbooks or letters or, you know, whatever. Everybody does it, and everybody's good at it. It's really amazing. And if your magazine is not looking good, it's really a problem. Um, and, and, you know, so to answer Joyce's question, I think the magazines have to look good. There's a real imperative. And, and you, you know, and there's also a lot of competition. and, and and these days, if your magazine doesn't look good, it just feels dated, and, and it doesn't feel, uh, there's not just not an imperative to it, and it doesn't have the gravitas that people want to, want to give to it. So certainly design is very important. And, and again, as I mentioned, because increasingly you're doing this stuff, you know, to, to go back to your question, it's the website, it's the app, it's the magazine, it's the email newsletter, you know, it's the social media platform. They've got to be branded, and how they're branded is by the graphic design, and by the look, and by the logo, and by the colors, and by the typography. And it's really essential that that 
you know, to, to, to make that happen. Okay, this is the hard one. Do you have any time management design production tips that could help me? This is from Sharon Silverson. Is she here, Sharon? Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> you must be, so I take it, this is a problem. <laughs> this is a person who's overworked, right? <laughs> This is the hardest question I got. I was really stumped by this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I thought a long, long time about this, but I have some advice. Um, um, do, do, you, do you work in InDesign? Yeah, OK, good. Do you use libraries? Yeah, I mean, that, you, know, you, probably, you probably are already doing these things, so I'm sorry. Like, after I give you my tips, you're probably going to say, I'm doing them all already. <laughs> and then I don't know what to tell you. But um, you know, certainly, here's, here's my one tip to you, which is save everything you ever do as an art director and put it in a folder somewhere. When I was at Reader's Digest, we had, they had the, the guy who was my deputy had been there 10 years, and he had saved every failed cover and every failed layout he'd ever done, he saved in a really scientifically arranged set of folders. So I can't tell you how many times we went back to those folders and pulled things out. And of course, the editor who was new there had never seen this stuff. And she would go, how do you guys come up with all these ideas so fast? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you know, oh, well, uh, you know, the last editor hated this. Uh, but you know, that's a simple thing, but I can't stress enough. And, and the time-saving part is just when you save that stuff, save it in a way you can find it without having to spend an hour looking for it, which is always my big problem. But that's one thing. And I don't mean, you know, I think it's, you come up with a million ideas as an art director, and, and you should save them because, it, you know, they're going to come back and be able to, to, to be used. The other thing, and you say you're already using libraries. I really stress, if you're not using libraries to the max, that's a great way to, 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 to save a lot of time. Um, when, when I was in Entertainment Weekly, we saved all our layouts, our pages as libraries. So when we wanted to, you know, we would be doing a, a chart or a table or something, rather than having to create it from scratch, we would just pull out the old page with it on and boom, there it was. I can't tell you how many times, that, how much time that saved us. Of course, things started to look the same after a while, but you know, you can only do so much. I mean, the library system is great, is really great. And um, I think the other thing is that you have to, as a designer, you have to triage a little bit. And if you're finding that, you know, there's this fine line you spend with time, which is to get it done and then to make it look great, you know, and, and that kind of the, the line between getting it done and making it look great is where you end up staying at work till 10 o'clock at night or working, you know, working at home on the weekends. And, and that is hard to quantify. But, you, you know, you can start by, I would just urge people, when I, to go back to the grid thing, the tighter the grid, the tighter your format, the less time you're going to spend on the basics of it. And, and I look at a lot of, I hate to go back to this grid thing, <clears throat> but it's, it's one of my big bugaboos. I look at a lot of magazines that have just crazy column widths and crazy grids, and it looks like they're designing each page from scratch. And I don't get that because it's, it, I don't think it looks good and it reads good, but also it, it just seems like it's a lot of work. Um, I think a lot of your pages should be really formatted and you just throw them down. And you know, the quality of your, of your magazine is going to be based on the quality of the content and the quality of the imagery and the consistency of the design on most of the pages. You know? And so if you're really spending a lot of time on the design, then maybe you need to strip down the design and format it more. You know, Right, and right. And not, <clears throat> not knowing my ad count and not getting my the images and all that stuff on time crunches my time and my deadlines. So I have four days to get a magazine done. And, it, you know, that, those are the things. And so I don't know how to, um, you know, we talk about it, we enforce it, or we try, I send emails, so, you know, make sure I get this by this time because it's, it's hard to create it, right? Like we have our typical, um, I guess you, you'd call them, you know, there's features and then there's our article article types and I guess so I can start on those but a lot of times I don't get the uh, I won't get the photos on time and and knowing the ad count is the biggest thing so I'll be dealing with a lot of small ads and to make them all look good in the in the right um, amount of pages and not have any spaces um, I need to have all that before I can even go forward and that's as far as the design 
design would feature a, a double page spread is all great once I get the right, book. Right, right. That, that all stays the same. Like, I mean, I, I you know, get little, a little creative on our two page spreads and stuff like that. But other than that, it, that's not really the issue as far as once I get everything. It's just getting everything. Is any, is, are there other people that confront? I'm sure everyone else has this problem. Is there anyone that, that has a, any smart solution for her that's worked for you? The production schedule will make sure the other teams meet the deadline. Yeah. Push back as an art director. Sit down and have a meeting and we get the ride out. <laughs> You've probably tried that already, right? Well, And anyone else confronted this? This is the worst. I mean, this is the worst problem we always have. I mean, everyone always has. I think I've failed to come up with an appropriate answer on this one. <laughs> Do you have to create the ads as well? Yeah. You do. That's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have all my sympathy, Sharon. Sorry. <laughs> Someone buy this woman a drink tonight. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's another question from Kim. Thank you. Let's see. Well, you got a nice technique. Uh, how do we? This is sort of the second part of your first question about you know preparing for the future, which is how do we as designers stay inspired, and how can I inspire and motivate my team? Um, I find that, that these days it's, you know, there's, there's two ways, there's two sort of levels of inspiration. One is the work that you do that you're inspired by, and the other is, you know, the work that other people do that inspires you. And I think, you know, you're, you're very fortunate these days because it's very easy to, there's so much great work going on. This is sort of the goal, in, in some ways the golden age of publication design is now because there's so much amazing work. I mean, you know, even just the work that's going on here in, in Alberta, when um, Suzanne and Rebecca from, from the association sent me the magazines, I was blown away, like, oh my gosh, like, there's a lot of great work up here. And, and you find that in every region there's just tons of great work, so that's the good news. And, and the even better news is that it's so easy to find this stuff and see it. There are so many websites that share this stuff, so many cover websites, and, and I have a couple um, links for you I'll, I'll share at the end. But, you know, there's a cover site called Cover Junkie. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. A uh, guy's based in um, the Netherlands. And every day he posts, you know, a dozen uh, covers or more from all around the world. There's another one called NASCA Pass, N-A-S-C, NAS, N-A-S-C-A-P-A-S, which is from Brazil. And they do the same thing. Every day the guy puts up a couple dozen new covers from all around the world. Trade magazines, business magazines, consumer magazines. It's phenomenal that you can see this stuff. And there are lots of websites like that. So for starters, if you want to get inspired by just what other people are doing all around the world, it's really easy to find this stuff, and that's the good thing. Um, and it's, it's really easy to connect with people. You know, people are, are very willing to, did you want, I'm sorry, you were just stretching. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so what's your number one tip for someone designing a magazine? Let me come back to that, okay? Let me finish this, then we'll come back to it. Um, so I think to find inspiration is really easy. There's tons of stuff out there. Um, now, how can you inspire and motivate your team? There's lots of different ways to do that. And, um, you know, when I was, I worked at Fortune, what we used to do is we had monthly lunch meetings with the art staff and photo staff, where we would do like, basically like show and tells. And we would say, come in and bring your, this sounds silly, but it was really, it really worked. Come in and bring your favorite album cover, and people would bring in their favorite album covers. Or come in and bring a book that inspired you visually, and people would bring in books. And it was a great way to build a team and also to just to talk about a visual aesthetic and, and help get this shared visual aesthetic. We also did monthly art shows at Fortune 
Um, and you know, Fortune had this history of uh, great art covers from back in the 30s and 40s. And we would do monthly art shows of like historic uh, covers. You know, we would go back to the vintage covers and we post up replicas of them. Or we'd have people on staff who did photography or artwork, and we'd post their f photos up. Um, or we would have contributors, you know, illustrators or photographers, and we would do shows with them. And that was really great, too. Uh, and I think another way, on that same note, to help inspire staff, I can't stress this enough because it doesn't happen enough, is to get your illustrators and photographers to come in and visit and show their work. Um, you know, one thing I hear a lot from art directors these days is they, they relate to everybody, you know, by email these days. And they used to be, you know, once a week you'd have a photo portfolio day and every guys would all show up with their books. And it doesn't happen that much. And I, I don't know, you know, what, you know, whether you work with people locally or most of them are out of town, but um, getting people in to physically show their books, it's, it's amazing. And it's so inspiring, you know, to meet people and talk that way. Um, so that's some things I would do to start, to, you know, to, to do team building and stuff. Um, I think also um, it's good to give people projects, to give ownership of projects, and that's not nearly done enough. And, you know, what people on your team want is ownership of projects and, cre you know, creative fulfillment. Now, that goes hand in hand with sort of development and stuff, and that's not always possible. But as much as possible, I would try to play to their strengths and give them projects that they can own you know, and feel like that they're the creative leaders on. One of the nice things about doing all these platforms now is you find that there's people on your staff who might not be like the most brilliant designers, but they might be the best social media people on your team or the best iPad people. And, you know, as the creative director or art director, you don't necessarily have to be the, the main worker and the main, you know, focal point on all those projects. Maybe you're your deputy is the better iPad person, and you delegate to your deputy uh, the iPad or, or the social media. But I think you've got to delegate. That's another you know, great team building thing. And, and of course, for you people that don't have teams that you can delegate to, that's a problem. <laughs> Does that help, Kim? Does that make sense? Um, is Chaz here? Chaz Ogden? OK. Um, this is a real you know, business question. So. Um, all signs point to the digital future. How can we make a meaningful transition in this world of doing more with less? Does a publisher beef up staff or contract outside the company? Um, I, I assume this is something you're all confronting. And you know, one of my big beefs is, uh, is outsourcing. And I'm going to mention that at lunch today, too. But I think outsourcing is really bad uh, for everybody. And um, you know, um, it, I think in the long run, there's no positivity. I mean, it, it's, it's only about cutting back and cutting back staff. And I don't think that brings anything to your brand or anything to your magazine to outsource. And, and I think the biggest problem right now is that um, publishers are reacting to difficult economic times by cutting back staff. And um, it's really a short-sighted thing. There's no, there's no plus to that in the long term. I, I'm, I'm probably not telling you guys anything you don't know, um, but, um, you know, you just have to look at the newspaper industry. And I know the newspaper industry in Canada is, is suffering the same kinds of things we, we are in the States, which is they cut back staff and they cut back staff and they outsource and they outsource. And you end up with nothing. There's no soul and there's no content. And then they wonder why people don't read newspapers. It's because they're crap, you know, because there's no, there's no stories anymore. There's no space and, and, and the talent is left. And, but you know what, they're still efficient and they've outsourced all their operations, so they're still making money. But you can see where that's going. You know, I mean, that where that's going is there are not going to be any newspapers in five years. And if, if you, as publishers of magazines, you continue to outsource and strip your staff down, it's going to work in the short term. But in the long term, you know, you're not going to have a business. I mean, uh, I feel very strongly about this. And, and um, I think that, you know, the key to doing more with less is to really f tap into people on your staff that aren't being fully utilized. And this goes back to what I was saying to you, Kim, that there are people on your staff who are not you know, fully being given the responsibilities they could, probably a lot of younger people. You know, put them in charge of stuff. You know, but, uh, and and you, know, you, may, you may find an assistant somewhere who would just could handle your social media you know, strategy, and that would be perfect. Um, this is a tough one, though, and I, I assume everybody's confronting this, which is we're all working triple time with half as many resources. Um, and that's not going to change, you know, unfortunately. 
well, a lot of people actually asked about this award. This was actually a, a few people asked about this. And, um, you know, congratulations to everybody who won an award last night. There was a lot of good stuff up there I saw. Um, and, you know, awards are really good. <laughs> Everybody says this about awards. They're really great if you win them. If you don't, they're meaningless. <laughs> you know, <like> <laughs> that's pretty much what everybody says. Like, didn't get nominated this year. Awards, they're, they suck. You know, the judges are terrible. They always just give them to the same people. But then when you win them, they're like, oh yeah, they're great. Those judges are so smart. Um, but you know, awards are good. I mean, I think for you know, for for folks who won awards last night, it's very validating and it's really good when your peers give you the acknowledgement. On a, just on a personal level, it makes you feel good, and it makes you feel, you know, like you're doing something wonderful. And and the business people love awards. It's really great. You know, there's nothing they love more than saying we're an award-winning magazine. And as an art director, I found, you know, the the business people, in some ways, the business people appreciated uh, design and art awards more than the editorial people did because they they were maybe a little jealous, you know, when we won awards. So I mean, I think awards are good. I think if you win an award, you have to make sure everybody knows you won an award. <laughs> That's really important. And, and it's the, so after the glow, warm glow passes over, you've got to be sure you put it up on social media and you get it out and the people see it and they understand what it means. I think that's really important. You know, for everybody who won an award last night, you should be posting it. And, and the second thing is you should be sure that you're using it as a team building thing. And people forget when you win an award, Get credits up there. Everybody who worked on it, who got near it, get their name up on there. You know, I mean, spread the love around. It's really important. And, and to go back to the team building thing, that's a great way to, to, to work on building your team and inspiring your staff. Be sure they get credit for it. Um, you know, I don't think awards define a magazine, you know, but again, what they do is they help you from a business side because the business people really like to promote them, and that's good. Um, I, I, I think you know, tips, for, tips for winning awards. You know, if you have a, the, the smaller the resources you have, unless you're a genius art director, the best way to win awards are for your visuals, for your illustrations or photographs. Probably the best way is for your illustrations. Um, I saw, I don't know who, you guys won one for illustration, right, didn't you? Was it for that Eddie Guy illustration? No. Uh, no, uh, Deshaun. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, if you, you know, if I was working in a small magazine and I wanted to score an award, I'd just reach out to some illustrator that would work for me, let them do a full page illustration and stay out of the way of it, you know, and that's the quickest way to win. Like, the illustration category was really good, you know, for, for not only the one you won, but all the others in the group, they were really good. I mean, there was a lot of great illustration there. It's pretty easy to get good illustration these days. That's the cheap, and that's the, the, the quick and dirty way to get an award, I think. It's harder for design because you've got to have some talent. <laughs> it doesn't take much to call a great illustrator and, and get him, him or her to do some work. Oh, this is a good one. Is Vanessa here? OK. Oh, there you are. Good. Are you working on an iPad yet? Uh, we did do the iPad. You did. And now we've just kind of moved to outsourcing it. It just published to social media. How many issues did you do? And I'm guessing your rate of return is not so good, right? <clears throat> um, okay, we can talk more about that. Um, it, it's a hard time for iPad and iPad apps because people are finding uh, Vanessa's experience, I think, pretty common, is you put a lot of time and energy into these things and then they just sit there and nobody really responds. I'm guessing that's what happened. Were you selling it or giving it away? Do you, is it, do you think it was on point with your readership? Like, uh, is, does Avenue have the kind of readers where a lot of them have iPads? Uh, yes. Yes. I think it had a lot to do with how we successfully get it out there that you know, they were free to just download it. Um, it was how to market it. I mean, it was. I think that, that's a real, that's been a problem for everybody. And, and I think what you find, and uh, I'm going to talk more about this at lunchtime too, is Everybody's having different experiences with the app right now. My, my first thing is what I said at the start, is I think if you haven't done an app, you should do one. You really need to learn how to do it. No matter that they're, they're, they're experiencing a glitch right now and a lot of people are sort of falling off of them, 
there are always going to be apps around, and there's always going to be a future for them. Maybe not at your magazine, but maybe the next one you work at, you know, or maybe your next gig, whatever it is. If you, if you can get your, I mean, you know, if you can get your hands on doing an app, you just really need to because it's, it's really a key technology. But, but you're going to have these problems like they experienced at Avenue. And, and part of the problem is you need to develop apps that are, you, not every magazine will have an app, I think, moving forward because the audience just isn't there. Um, you know, at Time Inc., they're having a real problem with their apps right now. They, they came out of the box and they did these very elaborate apps and they just, they had the same experience you did. They just sat there and nothing happened with them. So now they're basically turning them into replicas. Well, the bad news is nobody wants replicas, so they're not going to go anywhere with those. So they're just going to lose them. But other publishers are having great success. The New Yorker, Reader's Digest, Wired, they're doing very well. Popular Mechanics, um, they're doing very well. But when you look at the apps of the magazines that are doing well, it makes sense. Either their readers, are the, are, that's their sweet spot. A lot of them have iPads or the, the app itself is really energetic and engaging and, and it speaks to the readership. There are reasons they're doing well. And, and so that's the first thing. I, I haven't seen your app. It might have been brilliant for all I know. But the first question is, was it a great app? Was it in the reader's sweet spot? And, 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 and is it the right app for your audience? You know, or do they even want an app? Um, it might have been that avenue, again, I haven't seen your app, but it might have been that you would have been better served doing topic-focused apps, you know, like restaurants, like a restaurant app. You download it, and it's got info on all the restaurants. It's timeless. It's not a, it's not a timely thing. If I'd been advising Avenue, that's what I would have suggested. I would have said, start out by doing topic apps. You know, um, do a food app first. Don't, don't spend a lot of money doing monthly apps. Try a food app, make it free, and see what the download rate is. And then if there's interest, go forward with that. Um, my guess is that a food app that listed every restaurant and, and you know, they, they had like listed all the reviews you'd done and, and had all the cheap restaurants and all that stuff, that probably would have been pretty popular if you had marketed it right, you know. I mean, I might be wrong, but. Would you suggest, like I started building an app for our Roberts um, project, <coughs> and I was kind of going to go more of a uh, events and stuff happening in the area because we're, you know, we're about arts and entertainment in the area. And I was just going to kind of focus on that but not actually have a CD for anything. Like it would just be information. Do you suggest that? Or? Well, I think doing a topic app is a great idea, but doing, if I, not to be disrespectful, but I think that's a bad idea, what you're suggesting. Because the, the apps are very, they're closed. They're singular experiences. They're not updated news, timely experiences. Restaurant review is one thing, because you want to sit and read a restaurant review. But wh what's going on, that's a, that's a website, you know. Um, you, when you, you, know, you just have to think, think of how people use apps. You're sitting at home, you're sitting on your couch, you're reading your iPad, or I don't know where you read your iPad, but it, it tend, you know, they, they have this phrase called iPadding, which is what they refer to as the time when people sit around at home and they read and play with their iPads. But it's a very solitary experience, and it's very closed, and people tend not to go out so much, there. I mean, out of, their, out of their iPad, you know, they tend to stay in. So I think you want to have information that, that is not timely. You know, I don't think that's, it doesn't feel like that's what people are using the apps for. Because I find it a pain when I go on the websites and then have to zoom in with my iPhone to see listings of shows, what's happening at Ship and Anchor, what's happening here, what's happening there. If it was a nice breakdown list, it would be better. But there you just touched on something. You're talking about going using your phone, right? Yeah. Not, not your iPad. And that's a different story. Okay. I, I think an, the kind of app you talked about would be great to do for a phone app. That would be brilliant. But for an iPad app, it would be bad. Um, I, and, and which brings up another point, which is that I think a lot of people are, are thinking now that the next step is all about phones. That phone app development is really going to be where it's at. Because it's so right. First of all, the, the phone usage is so much, I mean, the rate is so much higher than iPads, obviously, because everybody uses their phones for information. And if you are, you know, to go back to Avenue, 